and YouTube to our History, Theology, and Philosophy Meetup. And I also want to welcome everyone who is here with me at Toronto Center Place. Um, pretty well, every Tuesday we gather at 7 o'clock uh, to discuss topics that are under this kind of broad rubric of history, theology, and philosophy with the idea, though, of um, talking about things in such a way that they have relevance to our lives now and how we are um, living our life meaningfully. Um, I, since, since Shaheen has just moved and <laughs> taken over the control of the microphone, which I appreciate, um, I want to remind everybody that uh, because we are doing the um, live stream, if you have a comment or question, um, raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you so that we can um, hear you on the stream because people um, otherwise can't understand what anybody's asking about and <laughs> it's not as and they like to hear the comments from here since there's a lot of really great comments that we have. Um, my name is John Hamer and I serve as the coordinator of the meetup. My background uh, uh, in training graduate schools in the um, field of medieval history and so this tonight's topic is going to be right in my wheelhouse. I've also um, served as a professional math maker for many academic presses and museums and I serve as a theologian in my um, church community, uh, where I also serve as pastor of this facility. Oops, I went the wrong way. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. And our, our approach to continually learning and growing in these kinds of um, uh, meetups are in, engaged in us being able to do that, living life more meaningfully together. Next week, um, we are going to go back to our series that we did last uh, year. We began last year on free will. So last, um, you, don't have to, you don't have to have been to the last one, <laughs> although you can always watch it online if you'd like to. Um, so we tried to kind of just grapple with the dimensions of the problem. Um, uh, between these kind of ideas of both free will and determinism and are they in fact in, in opposition or is there some kind of way to understand them together compatibly so that um, they don't have to be in opposition and we, we mapped out a bunch of different uh, thought experiments using time travel and, and Superman and <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Anyway, so this time what we're going to do instead is get the historical context for the question and we'll look at, we'll go back to the ancient Greeks and the uh, philosophers as they are starting to formulate the problem, but we'll also talk even before that about um, notions that uh, the people who in the old religions, the pagans um, had in terms of their ideas of, of fate. Uh, we'll look at the ideas, for example, in South Asia of karma. Uh, we'll look at ideas like in the medieval West, uh, Islamo-Judeo-Christianity, the idea of um, God's will, and if you have an omniscient God, um, what does that do for free will, <laughs> you know, and also um, the ideas of providence. And so we'll look at all that kind of stuff, and that we probably can't possibly get all the way to the end of the history of free will, but we'll see what we get through next week, and it'll be an ongoing series, and it should be pretty interesting. I'm excited for that one. Tonight, um, our lecture is on uh, women mystics in medieval England. I want to always start here by um, thanking you for your donations. Um, your, the fact that you throw money into the bucket when you come here is what makes us be able to um, uh, keep these meetups going. And that's also true for you who are joining us uh, via live stream. If you can go to our web play, set, uh, website, centerplace.ca, you can scroll down. Um, there are places where you can donate, and that's one that allows us to continue to make this content available um, as we fill out our, our YouTube channel archive and continue to do these different streaming events and actually expand our, our content offerings. So some of this, um, when we're talking about the idea, women mystics in medieval England, it was hard to get a, the title of this because he had to kind of have all four of those words. <laughs> and so how are we going to, you know, throw that all together? It makes for kind of a long title. Um, what is, you know, part of this is going to be, um, you know, what is, you know, what is mysticism? What is this mystical path? One of the things that is um, 
uh, sometimes surprising um, for people who are familiar, especially let's say with Protestant Christianity or mainline Protestant Christianity, is the idea that that mysticism or or meditation or the kind of inward path that that exists within the Christian tradition. It seems not likely, not like something that um, Protestants anyway do, <laughs> but it does turn out to have actually something. It is a practice um, that has. Uh, and an idea and, a, and a, a way of being anyway that has very deep roots within uh, many religious traditions. It's not like this, it's just from any one. So within uh, Islam there is mysticism. We've talked about before, we've done the uh, lectures indeed on the, the Sufi tradition and in, on, on Rumi, um, important thinker, theologian, and also poet uh, in the mystical path in Islam. Uh, we might do in the future one on Kabbalah, which is to say uh, mysticism in the Jewish path, and we've talked about, um, well anyway, all kinds of other different ways that we have mystic, uh, mysticism within other world religions, but it's also true that um, uh, the inward path, the idea of, of wanting through either meditation or through visionary experience uh, to be at one with or absorbed with or uh, become part of uh, through practice um, the divine, as opposed to um, constantly beating yourself over the head with sermons or lectures and, and uh, theology, which is one of the other paths, <laughs> you know, the, the kind of theologian's path, or um, uh, anyway, the other paths, paths of doing, for example, activism, doing charitable deeds, uh, and, and, and things like um, um, sacramental and or, uh, or him singing kind of practices, so that those kind of different fourfold paths, mysticism is certainly one that has deep roots in Christianity. Let's look at this time period in the Middle Ages, like the map maker, so I kind of want to locate <laughs> us on the map. Uh, when we're getting to uh, the 14th century, um, this is when the map of Europe has started to um, get to be more identifiable. Um, some of the uh, the remnants of what had been going on in the Roman times are, are, have faded away. There's still the last remnants of the Roman Empire here, uh, centered around the new Rome, Constantinople. But by and large, um, the whole east and south, you know, has now become uh, part of uh, the Islamic world, the Muslim world. Um, the other, the West Roman Empire has now contracted to kind of be uh, Germany and his indeed, although it's all sort of still one um, zone, it's called the Holy Roman Empire. Um, in fact, uh, the, the collapse of the emperors as a uh, powerful force has meant that there's increasingly all kinds of tiny little states in here that um, won't reunify again until uh, modern times. But meanwhile, the new reality of what is going to start to become the origin of nation states France and England are kind of emerging, uh, and, the, and as the Spanish states have uh, almost uh, pushed the Muslims off of the peninsula, that that's also going to start um, having that kind of a, uh, a rise. So uh, we're looking specifically in this in medieval England, and it's of course very much attached to France at this time as part of the uh, ongoing uh, context of the war between England and France. So. The Hundred Years' War, which is um, a historian's term that isn't numerically accurate since the war lasts longer than 100 years uh, and indeed is actually not ongoing the entire time. There's periods of very long truces and, and it's not like the French liked the English before the war and, or after. And so it actually could be a lot longer than this if we wanted to. But one of the things that happened was that in this kind of time period as we're looking at it, um, in addition to kind of the map starting to take shape, the other thing is if you, um, uh, let's say, are looking at Disney castles or are thinking about um, knights and chivalry and, and, and all that kind of thing in the kind of most fantasy terms, so plate mail and all those kind of things, this is where the kind of the time period where it really all starts to take that kind of visual shape, um, even if the, uh, the real heyday of, of knights is maybe before this, but now it is, um, anyway, looks more like what we think of it. Um, and for this, we have this King Edward III, who reigns 50 years 
through the middle of the 14th century, who really embodies this image of the chivalric king. And so he's actually for, at least at the time period, just an amazingly popular king. He's really good looking. He does all the things that a medieval king is supposed to do. He loves things like tournaments and all the kinds of going to jousts and stuff like that. Um, and uh, he also is a warrior king who uh, brings victory in battle. So um, from, yes, go ahead, Sheen. Is, is Edward III the one who starts the Order of the Garter? Um, or was it his grandson? I am forgetting when the Order of the Garter started, but anyway, so it could well be. <laughs> um, but anyway, in this kind of time, a chivalric order. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, England's kings uh, prior to this time had been major landholders in France since, you know, beginning with the Norman Conquest when the, the Dukes of Normandy actually become the kings of England and then afterwards when the Angevins, uh, Henry II and his son Richard the Lionheart and also his son John, uh, rule half of France in addition to ruling England. But King John, who was possibly England's worst king, um, uh, certainly the one that does a lot of really bad stuff, the guy who was most well known from the Robin Hood um, movies, <laughs> although that's a late um, change to the time frame of when the stories of Robin Hood are set. Anyway, so King John lost all of that, uh, except for the little part in the south uh, uh, had been his mother's domain, Aquitaine, um, but what's left is the area around Bordeaux, Gascony. So um, Edward, the third's cousin is the King of France. Um, when the King of France tries to seize that last uh, bit of English land in Gascony, um, Edward's response was, "Well, my mom uh, was queen of was a I'm sorry was a princess of, of France. I'm a uh, uh, grandson of the the last kind of main king. You're just a cousin. I actually have a better claim to the throne. I'm King of France." <laughs> And so uh, not only has decided he's going to take all of the lands back uh, that the English kings have lost, but is also going to say, well, at least he's promoting the idea that I'm going to play hardball with you <laughs> and I'm going to claim the whole, whole uh, kit and caboodle. Although he was always willing to, it seems like, negotiate and negotiate down from that point if he could use that as a lever to get what he wants. But anyway, it essentially begins an um, all-out uh, fight as the English are... Uh, essentially cross the channel to fight around in the French, burn a bunch of stuff, and try to claim uh, the throne over there. Didn't have time to make a better version of this chart, but um, I'll try to spell it out. Essentially, the idea here is we have um, Edward III of England. So he's a Plantagenet. Um, his, uh, he was, his dad, Edward II, is married to Isabella of France, who is the daughter of Philip IV of France. Her brothers were king, but they didn't have any uh, male heirs, and so uh, the throne went down the line, what we call the Valois kings, through essentially her father's brother's son, son, and, and son and son. So these guys are the ones, the cousins of Edward, become uh, the kings of France. And so he does have a pretty good claim uh, to be king of France, but he doesn't exercise it at the time the throne is vacant. He only exercises it when his cousins try to take his land. So, at this time, um, and through the Middle Ages and all the way still to this point, the idea of kingship is very much uh, related to being the leader of, uh, of the knights in battle. And kingship, um, you're a good king if you win battles. And so, um, Edward and his son, Edward the Black Prince, uh, they're extremely popular in part, uh, and their wars that they're fighting are extremely popular because they uh, bring a bunch of different victories. And so although they were always kind of outnumbered in terms of wealth and resources, um, Edward won a kind of a major crazy victory at a place called Crecy up here in the north in 1346. And then his son won an even more devastating uh, victory uh, from the south in Poitiers uh, when just huge numbers of the French nobility were all killed. 
uh, and he actually succeeded in capturing the King of France himself. And so then the king was brought back as a hostage. And so as a result of that, the English were able to negotiate a very um, favorable treaty where they get a bunch of, their, they only had a little bit of land around Bordeaux, they get a bunch of this back uh, according to the treaty and they get this huge, what, what we call a king's ransom. <laughs> so when you, you know, catch the king, so the whole rest of the country has to pay just enormous amounts of money to ransom the king back. Okay, but between when that's happening, <laughs> Um, something else happens in the fourth, uh, 14th century, which is the uh, bubonic plague, the Black Death, um, which because of the trade that has occurred because of the existence of the Mongol Empire, um, Europe and China are more connected than they ever have been before, and essentially plague is able to make it across those trade routes. It makes it to uh, the Crimea, and from there, through Constantinople and on the merchant to the merchant republics, Genoa and Venice, and thence all the way up and around, including to England, and then back again that way. So I'm devastating the Muslim world, everything too. Uh, so between 75 and 200 million people in Eurasia die. <laughs> the percentages of the death keep going up and up as they recalculate it. And so it's not just who died the first time it swept across, which may be a third of the population, although in some places as much as half, half the people in Paris died. Um, uh, but also then it would continually recur. And so it's just something that we can't probably fathom, if you can just imagine looking around the room, half of the people <laughs> being dead, you know, not being here like, you know, within a six or month period of time. Um, so it definitely would cause all kinds of stresses on the society, as you can imagine, you know, you'd ask maybe metaphysically, why is this happening, uh, is you even just try to get your basic economy going, is you just try to do the physical task of burying everybody. Um, these are all just um, amazingly um, stressful and life kind of paradigm changing events. Um, so for example, just to look at it, in the 14th century, um, there had been this upswing all through the central middle ages until the 14th century uh, where Europe's economy population, they had been reviving, uh, land was continuously being brought under cultivation. The population of England from maybe 1.7 million people at the time of the Norman Conquest had gotten up to maybe 5 million by the time the plague hit. So, uh, and then that um, number, that's not achieved again in England. That, that population number gets halved and even less. Um, into the early modern times, and it doesn't come back into the pre-plague uh, uh, heights again until the 1600s. So if you can imagine, it's just a, just a huge devastation um, to the population. And so we'll have here, you can see, um, just as we're looking at the after, this is after the plague, uh, um, the size of the towns, they're all very tiny. So London is the only town that has more than 20,000 people in it. Uh, and we'll see here then there's a couple other towns that are between five and ten, like Bristol and York. And then this next size, two to five thousand, includes towns that we'll see like Norwich and King's Lynn, which is going to have the people, uh, the women that we're talking about tonight. Okay, so how is the, um, the Hundred Years' War continued to go? It's not over yet just because <laughs> we've gone through that much. So while the war is popular and lucrative when the kings are busy winning battles. If they start really losing battles, um, the opposite happens. And so now the war becomes very expensive and it becomes something that nobody wants to go do. Um, and the kings become very unpopular. Uh, and so one of the things that happened was uh, that the Black Prince, uh, which is the Prince of Wales under Edward III, he died before his father died. Uh, he died of illness. And so it's not him, but his son, uh, Richard II, who becomes king when his grandfather dies, when Richard II is at age 10. And so he is then, um, of course, not fully in charge as a 10-year-old. And instead, his um, uncles um, are, are largely running the show. Uh, all then of these stresses that we have uh, from the plague and also from the cost of having to finance um, just ongoing wars and military occupations um, lead to lots and lots of stresses in English, 
England, and one of the things that happens is in 1381 there is a major revolt called the Peasants' Revolt, uh, but does not only include the um, lowest classes, but includes a lot of people who have uh, a fair degree of buy-in. So we, it's always premature here to start saying middle class and things like that, but what we might think of as being like lower middle class or working class people. Um, so it is not simply just the poorest people that join in. So one of the leaders, a guy named John Ball, um, uh, as he was going around, it is kind of a revolutionary um, movement and is, um, is also looking at, for example, the very elaborate hierarchy and also the um, uh, wealth inequality and power inequality that exists, um, and is looking at that and is asking, wait a second, why, how, is this, how is this God ordained? Do, should we have to uh, always be kept in our place like this? And so he had a great um, little ditty <laughs> that they would quote, and he'd say, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then a gentleman? It's a great couplet. And so um, Adam is a farmer and Eve is um, spinning or whatever to create cloth. And so there's only two people in that time period in Genesis. And so how was there at that time when we essentially the patriarch, the person who's the leader of humanity and, and the queen of humanity, when they are doing all the work themselves, who was then this, who, where was the social class of gentlemen who doesn't work, who's only in charge of fighting and things like that, who's keeping us forever uh, in this uh, lower class status of being a peasant. And so um, where does he get this idea? <laughs> so one of the things, Ball was influenced by an English church reform movement that is called uh, Lollardy, the Lollards. And there's no particularly good explanation of why it's called Lollardy, but anyway, that's the popular name for it. Um, this had been inspired by an Oxford theologian named John Wycliffe. And Wycliffe was a very radical uh, thinker who was very opposed to the concentration of wealth uh, in the church and also uh, with the way how uh, essentially prelates of the church living as kind of princes and not doing any, anything like their, what should be their, their charitable tasks or being pious. Um, this is already the time period when the church has now started to um, sell indulgences. It has started to do things to, in order to you know, focus its own kind of wealth. And so he is an early kind of radical who wants to get rid of the church's property. Um, he even kind of says there's really no, no real need for um, priests and sacraments and even the papacy. <laughs> uh, monasticism, which had been the center to the Christian tradition through the Middle Ages. He advocated translating the Bible out of Latin the way it was always used, you know, so only therefore understood by the clerical educated elite and into vernacular languages. And he himself um, provides one of the first translations of the Bible into English. And so this is kind of the precursor to, you know, with a King James Bible and all this kind of thing. And he really wants to get rid of the system of having intermediaries between regular lay people who are pious and their relationship with God. So in other words, let's, we don't need the clerics to be, inter, be an intermediary, and we also don't need, for example, the cult of the saints to do that. And so in all of these kind of ideas, these are sort of precursors of what uh, English Protestantism will eventually be in a few centuries. There's a question here. Hey, uh, just out of curiosity, like, what do you mean by vernacular languages? What other languages were popular around there? Yeah, right, good question, England? I should say that, yeah. So, so a vernacular language would mean the language that everyday people are speaking. Uh, and so throughout all of Western history up till this point, um, the written language is always different from the vernacular language. Even in, in the Re Roman Empire and Roman times, regular people are speaking some kind of what they would call vulgar Latin, which is to say, vulgar just means crowd. So it means the, the thing that the crowd is speaking. Uh, and lat literary Latin would have had a very different character. Literary Latin has continued all the way till this time. Uh, it's you know, long past now the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, it continues to be the language of the church and the church is in charge of all education and universities and everything like that. So it's also the language of scholars and it remains the universal scientific language until whatever, the 18th, 19th century. Uh, even still, um, 
taxonomy, all kinds of things are in Latin, right? Muscles, if you're going to memorize those, um, there's all kinds of things that are still used uh, Latin. Latin also has, until this point, continued to be a living language, and one of the things that can happen is if you are a, a friar uh, in England and you, you learn Latin, and so you can go all the way over to Lithuania and visit, and the um, monks over there are also going to know Latin, and you can speak Latin to the people in, in southern Italy or anything like that, because that's still a universal language among the clerics, and it's also still a living language um, at this time, so it is also still evolving. So medieval Latin is actually rather different from um, classical Ciceronian Latin. Uh, the other language um, that would have been a literary language at this time, which should still count as a vernacular language, um, has been in England the language that had been the language of the nobility, which is Norman French. It's different from Parisian French, and so it's actually a kind of a sister language, and it continues to be um, used uh, in England, but with decreasing frequency. And so one of the things that is happening at this time, um, we'll hear a description in Chaucer of, of kind of the striving um, middle class people like the wife of Bath, and, and she is said to speak, you know, of kind of a French, <laughs> but it's kind of French that they speak, you know, in Bath or whatever, as opposed to because the, the language of Paris she doesn't know, right? And so they're making fun of, you know, French continues to this day, um, people who speak French tend to think of the only right way to speak French as being spoken in Paris and not legitimating, for example, our very good Quebec French, <laughs> which is its own separate thing, which is its own legitimate thing, but it also, even the people who speak it often think, well, that actually the real way you're supposed to be, speak French is Parisian French. And so anyway, there is a perfectly valid in, in medieval, in Norman England, um, different way of speaking French that continues, for example, um, it becomes, there becomes called, like, for example, law French, <laughs> so because the courts are still using French, but it becomes very, um, the, the lawyers don't know French, they only know law French. And so anyway, so as a result of this, it becomes this kind of strange thing. So there are a couple other different languages that are in circulation uh, in England, but at this stage, finally, um, Middle English, uh, which has evolved out of what the old Anglo-Saxon language had been, uh, the various Middle Englishes are now emerging and they are becoming um, a language that people see as fit for writing down again. And so they're becoming a language of literature again. And so Wycliffe here is translating um, the Bible into, you know, that language, into Middle English. Okay, so although Wycliffe is actually opposed to this Peasants' Rebellion, <laughs> nevertheless, like the rebels are very much infused with his kind of thinking. Um, uh, their interest, one of the reasons they kill the Archbishop of Canterbury is they're ready to um, get rid of a lot of bishops and that kind of a thing. Um, he's not anywhere, and this happens a bunch of times where the thinker uh, that's living in Oxford may well advocate a lot of um, revolutionary stuff, but when the heads start to roll, they're like, oh, wait a second, guys, I wasn't really meaning it so literally like this, right? So. Um, the rebels then demand that the king execute several of his officials. They want him to execute, for example, his uncles. Um, almost always when you um, have a monarchy and you rebel against the king, the pretext always is the king is good. It's all his um, officers that are being bad. And so what the rebels always want to do is they're rebelling in the king's name so that they can uh, restore the king to having good counsel. And so we definitely need to kill uh, his uncle, John of Gaunt, the prince who has um, been running the show, who's so bad. We definitely need to kill the Archbishop of Canterbury and some of these, these corrupt clerics and that kind of a thing, um, and replace it, things like that. And they also want to do a couple little things like outlaw serfdom, <laughs> you know, and uh, control all the rents. Uh, and so, and maybe also make it so that the, all of the lands that the church owns um, are uh, collectivized and split up and given to uh, them <laughs> as opposed to the church. So one of the things that happens then is then um, they, are, they have an army, they've kind of taken control of southeast England. The king uh, doesn't have much of an army with him. He's right just outside of London. They demand to meet with him and the 14-year-old king kind of bravely goes and does meet with them and kind of agrees to um, kind of go out with them into the field and discuss stuff. And uh, the thing, and then what ends up happening is that because the, the, he's negotiating with people who aren't 
um, lords and knights, they are not under the code of chivalry. <laughs> And so even though this whole, there's this whole high thing of chivalry, anyway, they, they get killed and, and the, the leaders and then he, all of the promises that he makes ultimately, you know, those don't count because they, you can't be making those two under duress. And so uh, essentially that all gets ultimately put down. So Richard himself um, continues to uh, then not have, a, he tries to have a, a policy of having a truce with France, which doesn't really work out, uh, is not very victorious can't go through all of the exigencies of it, but he's ultimately deposed by his um, cousin, who becomes then, and he's killed then, and his cousin becomes Henry IV. And we can't again go through the whole history of this, but Henry IV's son, Henry V, wins this final great victory over the French at Agincourt in 1415. And there's a Shakespeare play that kind of celebrates this. In 1420, uh, the Queen of France, who is his mother-in-law, signs a treaty stating that Henry and his heirs um, will now inherit the French crown. So she disinherits her own son, the Dauphin, which is like the French word for Prince of Wales, right? So here the, the heir will no longer be heir. And instead, Henry's son um, is supposed to then assume the, is supposed to assume both crowns and he'll be for real King of France and King of England, Henry VI. But what ends up happening is that the old um, insane king of France, um, uh, Queen of France's husband here, and Henry V um, kind of unexpectedly die right around the same time, leaving um, this baby, Henry VI, on, the, on both crowns, uh, but without anybody to really be in charge very effectively in France. Meanwhile, uh, when the kid finally does grow up, after the whole thing has almost fallen apart, um, he has some kind of an issue which is still debated by historians, but it may well be just not mentally competent. And so as a result of that, England uh, has to deal with this situation of monarchy only works when you actually have like at least a semi-competent king. <laughs> and so when you get into the situation like with Henry VI and you don't have one, everything pretty much falls apart. Um, so Hen France, we'll just mention then, the end of this war begins to recover in 1425 when a 13 year old girl began to receive visions of the Archangel Michael and also Saints Catherine and Margaret. Uh, those visions then inspire her to um, rally to the cause of the Dauphin, this disinherited um, heir to France, the Prince of France who owns still kind of the southern part of France. And um, she in leading uh, forces, breaks the siege of Orléans in 1429, and really kind of turns the tide and everything, the English occupation of France starts to really um, collapse. The English are not well regarded um, because their entire, um, their entire uh, strategy in the Hundred Years' War was pretty much to just loot everywhere and burn everything and take all the money back. And, and now, um, kind of when you have to actually rule the place, uh, the people aren't too excited about it. Anyway, so this is the first example that we're gonna talk about here. I, I went all the way to the end of this part of the Hundred Years' War because here's an example of a woman mystic, <laughs> you know, kind of from our time period, and she's probably the one that you're most familiar with. So people have heard of Joan of Arc, and uh, is frequently the, uh, they make movies about her a lot, <laughs> this kind of thing, right? So this is actually um, an era of influential female mystics. So we have Joan of Arc, whose visions really rally uh, France, the recovery of uh, French control of France. Um, there's another uh, really influential female mystic a little bit earlier, um, St. Catherine of Siena, who you might not be as familiar with because I don't make as many movies about her, but um, she is so renowned for her um, piety and for uh, her spirituality, that she's able to hang out in Avignon where the popes have been kind of in their sort of self-imposed palatial exile in the south of France, um, not living in Rome where everybody knows the pope is supposed to be in Rome, um, but Rome has been uh, in rebellion and also has been allowed to decay all the palaces and everything like that, so the popes just do not want to go back, and the popes are all French anyway. So anyway, nobody wants to go, go back to Rome. She guilts them into going back, <laughs> you know, uh, through the full force of her, um, you know, just out-piousing the pope, right? 
Um, another one that we'll just mention uh, is Bridget of Sweden. So again, they're all kind of not entirely contemporaries, but in this kind of time period. Um, she again is a visionary. One of the things that she does is find, found a new kind of spiritual order of um, nuns and monks who live in double houses. Um, but we'll mention Bridget because she is influential on the mystics that we're talking about tonight. And so one of the things that, um, that St. Bridget's visions accomplished is, okay, so she's a Sweden, she's having multiple different visions of Christ. One of those that she has is uh, that the Virgin Mary appears, and of course Mary has blonde hair because St. Bridget is Swedish, and so she just assumes that Mary has blonde hair. <laughs> and so, um, uh, and, and Mary in her vision, uh, as St. Bridget records it, uh, lays her babe down, uh, and the babe kind of is radiating light, and then um, Mary and her husband and everyone around kind of pray to um, uh, the infant Christ, right, so to the Christ child. And so one of the things, and, and this is a pretty common image if you guys are uh, thinking about, for example, like the nativity scenes that people set up, we often see um, the baby Jesus, often in the manger, but anyway, with the two parents maybe kneeling and praying next to. Um, but this, uh, uh, while it's the standard image, it's kind of the standard image because that's how St. Bridget described the image, and so it became so popular based on her, um, her vision. So before that in the West, we have, we have like a picture of the nativity over here from the windows of Chartres Cathedral, and it has it in this kind of a format. It almost always showed uh, the, uh, Mary reclining like this, um, and the, you know, the baby's over here in a manger, and she's reclining, and Joseph is kind of over here thinking, oh man, what's happening? <laughs> Uh, and that would have been the standard nativity image. So it kind of shows that um, um, all kinds of different impacts that these kind of visionary women can have, one of them be here being in terms of how people even picture um, this very famous story out of the Christian tradition, the nativity story. Okay, so this brings us to, oh, yeah. So, I need to pause it, I need it. Yeah, you do. So maybe this question. Oh, online, okay. Um, what's the deal with the bull and the donkey? <laughs> so what's the, yeah, so what's the deal with the bull and the donkey? So in the story in the Gospel of Luke, um, there's no room for them in the inn, and so they, uh, it, so the, it happens in the, in essentially the stable. Uh, and so there's the, and so they lay the baby in a manger, which is to say a food trough for the animals. And so it's almost always pictured in the, in both the, the donkey and the bull, or you know, and the cow end up staying in the in the picture uh, before and after the change, and so essentially you have the, the different animals that are in the in the um, stable with them. So Luke is emphasizing then the humble origins, right, of of uh, a god that's being born as king, and then the opposite happens in the canonical gospel of Matthew, where that's where you have the three kings come and, and essentially show that they know that this is gonna be the king of kings, right? So um, there's the different ways that early Christians are imagining the birth of the, their idea of the Messiah. Like just in reference to the animals, uh, like when Jesus was born, people spotted the star and a lot of people visited Mary, like when Jesus was born and they brought a lot of gifts. So there was a group of farmer or someone who had herders who had come and they brought a lot of animals with them. So, so those are two different stories and you've combined them and usually yeah. Christians do combine them. The one of them in Matthew, like you say, the kings, or it's not the kings actually, the, the Magi, we had, a, we had a lecture on this, the Zoroastrian priests, the astrologers come and they bring gifts, like you say. And then the other one, it's a bunch of shepherds that come. And so, so they maybe either bring their sheep with them or <laughs> Um, they, the shepherds find them in a, you know, in a, where the animals are anyway, and the animals are already there. So yes, absolutely. Those are the two different like ways. Maybe they brought the animals, and animals are just seeing where, where are they, what is, what is this, like, I don't know, yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah, and so that's what that, that's the way they show it. I'm just pointing it out that the thing that we actually see when, we, when Christians make these things nowadays, it's because of this vision that happens in the Middle Ages. Okay. So that brings us to our mystics tonight, the ones that we have here in medieval England, and they're actually both from the same part of England, Norfolk. Julian of Norwich, uh, which we have in, she lived, 
She was born in 1342, which is to say just a little bit before the plague, and she was still alive by 1416, and we don't know how long she lived after that. And then Marjorie Kemp as a little bit later contemporary, who uh, born maybe around 1373, and she was still alive by around 1438. We again don't know when she would have died. Ah, so I made a thing. <laughs> so we could kind of show this kind of context. I like to put a little bit, we did a, we did a geographical um, map, and this is a, a time map. And so we're going to go here from 1200 to 1600. And we went from King John that we mentioned. We talked about Edward III, who was that great chivalric king, and his son Richard, who was, uh, you know, headed off the peasants, and uh, but then got deposed by his cousin, Henry V. Henry VI, then that incompetent king that um, uh, loses the war, uh, the Hundred Years' War, and enters England into the War of the Roses. Anyway, and then that's going to lead us to Elizabeth, right at the end of this kind of period. Um, the Hundred Years' War, the War of the Roses, the Black Death that's happening, the return of the plague, the Peasants' Revolt. Here's John Wycliffe's life and the creation of Lollards. Lollards continue to exist, although they're persecuted after the Peasants' Revolt, and ultimately some of their ideas become Protestantism, and ultimately the Church of England under Henry VIII breaks with Rome and adopts some of these ideas. And certainly Martin Luther has some of those ideas as well. We talked about Bridget of Sweden, the woman whose vision changed the nativity. Catherine of Siena, the woman who um, uh, uh, guilted the Pope into going back to Rome. And Joan of Arc, the woman who guilted the Dauphin into taking up arms back and, and reconquering France. Anyway, so you can see right in the middle of that, here are our two women that we're talking about, Julian of Norwich, and Marjorie Kemp. So hopefully that gives us a kind of a time picture as well. Okay, so let's look at Julian of Norwich. So she's born in Norwich, which is in Norfolk, England. This is actually a, a 13th century, really cool map, um, Walter Mack, made of England, where you go from London here, and there's a road that's taking you all the way up to uh, Newcastle and things like that. But anyway, in the northeast of that, here in Norfolk, um, we have town here of Norwich. And so um, her actual name is unknown. We'll get to that. Anyway, we call her Julian of Norwich. When she's six years old, that's when the Black Death reaches her town. Probably a third of the people in the town um, die. The plague returns when she's maybe 18 or 19, and it kills another fifth of the population of England. And this first major recurrence of the plague is especially brutal to children because the children don't have any immunity. So a lot of the people who are alive that are older than that uh, lived through it the first time. Uh, the kids are brand new. And it also uh, tended to kill off a lot of young men. So it really hurt the population's capacity to uh, recover. It's speculated, but we don't know for sure. But she may have um, been a young married woman at that time. And she may have lost her family to the plague and become a widow. And that may have caused her to um, change her life, you know, based on that, although she doesn't fully say so. Um, however, what we do know is that when she's 30, and this is actually often a kind of an interesting time, peri time period when you get to be 30 years old, um, this is when you might have a big spiritual life crisis. So Jesus is 30, and <laughs> um, the, the founder of uh, yeah, Zoroaster was 30. The pastor of Zoroastrianism, the founder of, uh, uh, what is it, Sikhs, Sikhism. Yeah, is the Buddha is also 30, right? <laughs> Around 30. So not everybody's 30, but oftentimes you're 30. <laughs> and so, anyway, Julian's 30. This is when God wants to talk to you. You have another one that's 30? No, just that I, uh, Carol Jung So this is a, in medieval and ancient times, maybe when you have your midlife crisis, because at 30, you've gone through half your life. I mean, that's expanded maybe now to 
Um, hopefully 50, because I'm 50 and I would like to think it's, I'm only still halfway, but probably not. So maybe it's to 40 now, nowadays. Anyway, so at 30, that that's maybe why. So 30 is one of those times when sometimes spiritual leaders have their experiences. She becomes very seriously ill. She does this thing that medieval people do, which is take to their deathbed. A lot of times, very successfully predicting medieval people get on their deathbed and they know that they're going to die. They have a ritual where they bring everybody around. They, they make all of their kind of last um, statements to everybody, make amends with uh, what they want to do and bequests, and then they just die. <laughs> and that'll happen very often. In this case, that didn't happen. However, because she's on her deathbed, um, a curate, which is a, um, uh, uh, an assistant to the priest in the parish, uh, administers last rites to her and because he's anticipating that she's going to die. But as he has a crucifix held um, above the foot of her bed, she goes numb, she begins to lose her physical sight, and she sees instead with the sight of the inner sight, you know, the uh, visionary sight, and she gazes on the crucifix and then she saw the figure of Jesus bleeding and that begins a series then of uh, 15 visions uh, that she has through the night and then a, second, a 16th vision on the next night. So she completely recovers within a week uh, of her illness, um, and, and now she has got to decide what is she going to do with the fact that she's seen all of these visions, right? <laughs> Although she refers to herself in her own text as a simple creature unlettered, um, a lot of historians don't necessarily agree with her that she, does, that she was illiterate. Um, it's completely possible, but it's could just be a kind of thing that you say when you're humble, you say when you say you're an unlettered person, or it might indicate that she hasn't um, had a formal education in Latin, uh, which has been what um, the school, uh, which we, what, we, what you would have learned at Oxford or Cambridge at a university. Um, and instead, though, she may well have been able to write in her own tongue, which is Middle English. So whether it was by her hand or by a scribe then, um, sometime not too long after she had these visions, these were all written down, uh, and they were written down in Middle English, and like I said, that was emerging for the first time since the Norman Conquest as a literary language. So if, can I have the slides? So um, this is, this is, not the original manuscript, which is lost. This is a copy that was made. Um, uh, it's of what's called the short text, which is to say the one that was made of her visions very soon after that. Um, you can kind of even see here, it's got an H, right? Hira S uh, vision shuid. Anyway, here S a vision shuid to be the goodness, should it be the goodness, goodness of God to a devout woman and here name uh, S. Julian, that is recluse at, at uh, Norwich, and zit is on lef anno domini millissimo ccc x i i i, <laughs> right? And so anyway, so anyway, so this is a, a anyway in the year what that's fourteen uh, thirteen is when um, I guess maybe they're copying this copy of it. So this is the short text of it. So. Uh, when they're calling her then a recluse in that, in that introduction of the text, with, by that what they're meaning is that she is uh, an anchoress. And that means she's living as a hermit in a cell that is attached to a church. And in this case, she's attached, uh, the cell is attached to a church uh, of St. Julian, which is in the town of Norwich. And so that's why we really think it's quite unlikely that her actual name is Julian. <laughs> although it's completely, it's possible, but um, because the fact that, um, anyway, the church is called that, <laughs> they just call her essentially the, she's essentially the anchoress that is at the church of St. Julian uh, in Norwich. So to become an anchorite, which is what the men would be, or an anchoress, a pious candidate undergoes a ceremony, the bishop comes, uh, they sing the last, uh, the office of the dead, they sing psalms, Essentially, they are holding a funeral for the person who then goes into the cell that they've made that's attached to the church, and then they just get out the, uh, the mortar and the stones, and they just start walling up <laughs> the cell, and then you are inside there. It is not, um, there's not a door. You're not locked in. You are built in, <laughs> and so now you are become 
um, a part of uh, the church. <laughs> you know, you were, you were a fixture, not a, not a <laughs> visitor or something like that. And so the anchoress then at that point is in the church for the rest of her life. Um, and that's, and Julian, uh, the woman that we call Julian of Norwich then, uh, is there for many decades uh, living in her cell. So anchoresses in England um, had to live, they had a bunch of rules. Um, those were written down in a text called the Ancren A Rewale, I guess. Anyway, the, um, the rule for anchoresses. And because when you read the rules, one of the things that it says is you can have a cat. <laughs> so then as a result, a lot of modern pictures of Julian show her hopefully having a cat <laughs> so that uh, she's not all alone in there. Um, she's allowed to do a bunch of other things. Like, so people can, obviously people bring her food <laughs> um, and she's able to do things like uh, sew clothing and stuff for the poor while she's in there. And she's also able to um, spend lots and lots of time praying and people also can come to her and interact with her and she is therefore kind of performing then a spiritual role for the community, specifically as a person who's sort of, they've already done the last rites for and who isn't coming back out to the regular world anymore. She's sort of halfway to the other world, to the spiritual world, and she's certainly practicing that as a, as a mystic, this sort of inner otherworldly path. And so as a result, Anybody who is having some kind of a, like a spiritual problem, they've got a ready person who's kind of a real expert that they can go up and ask, you know? And so they will go up to the, the window in the cell in the church and they can you know, start to communicate with her, visit with her, and ask her these kinds of questions. And so she can provide then visitors with prayers, all kinds of spiritual insights, and she also has time to work on her own theological ideas and her own theological texts in her case. So 20 or 30 years after those visions that she had, she went back to um, the text of them uh, as they had been recorded, and she started to work out a new text, a theological text, where she explains her ideas about what she thought, what the theological meanings of all of these are. And her uh, longer text here, as it's called, um, it's ultimately published as in 1670 as the 16 revelations of divine love. Um, these work out what become actually a fairly um, orthodox and Trinitarian theology, albeit with a, quite a mystical approach, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's not necessarily totally likely that she's um, illiterate because she's knows she's not. Uh, she's well versed in the theology. It's actually uh, it's a pretty sophisticated theology uh, that she works out. But it includes a lot of very interesting and unique imagery that's just her own. Um, it's not uh, again, it's not uh, unorthodox. It's not heretical or anything like that. But it is it's unique and interesting. Um, what's also very interesting is how amazingly optimistic her theology is, especially considering these unsettling times she lives in. So she's living in a time when half and then a third or a fifth again of, of the people in her town have all died, uh, and indeed her whole country and the whole world as far as she knows it. Um, and there has been these unsettling times of the, um, like the wars, the depositions of the kings, the, um, uh, the revolts of the peasants and everything else like that. And nevertheless, um, her message or the message that her visions have given is, is essentially that you know, all is actually well. And there's a lot of um, reason to be very optimistic. Uh, so let's look a little bit at some of her um, actual texts so we can kind of get a flavor for it. I'm really not good at reading Middle English. I mean, you already can tell and I've been struggling <laughs> with this, but I put it on the side so you can kind of see. It's not so different that we can't kind of, you know, it's, it's harder than Shakespeare. But if you take a course in it, which I have not done, you can apparently learn Middle English pretty quickly in a, within a few weeks. Uh, and so anyway, so we can just kind of, if we kind of start this, this is from chapter five of Revelations of Divine Love. And in this, he showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut. <laughs> so you can kind of see that on the left. We don't have to, you can read along on the left as I read. The quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand. So she's got this vision. She's seeing just a little hazelnut. It seemed, and it was as round as any ball, 
I looked thereupon with the eye of my understanding, and I thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. So she's seeing in this little ball creation itself. She's seeing the cosmos, you know, all the celestial spheres essentially from the outside uh, from, as if it was just a, you know, a little ball or hazelnut in her hand. I wondered how it could last, for I thought it might suddenly fall to nothing for little cause. So creation maybe is on the brink of destruction at any time, you know, so for example, half the people in the world might die. <laughs> yeah. And so therefore it seems like, you know, we're approaching um, maybe uh, a destruction of everything that is. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and ever shall, for God loves it. And so everything has its beginning by the love of God. So creation, the creative power, the operative power being itself uh, is, and God as a creator is God as lover. So love is at the center of her theology, which is not totally, un it's not un unusual for regular Christian theology, and it's also quite um, common among mysticism, this approach where um, you are connecting to uh, everything, you're connecting to the source um, through a medium like love. In this little thing, I saw three properties. First, the first is that God made it, just to say the universe God made. The second is that God loves it, and the third is that God keeps it. So those are essentially her operative uh, philosophy for the universe, which is to say that the universe is good because it emanates from God, that it operates because uh, God loves it and God keeps it. And so it's gonna continue to exist that way. So it's actually optimistic for the future, not that we're about to um, have everything go completely destroyed or be bad. Then here's another point. Now if you get down to chapter 59, <laughs> I want to jump in. This is a thing that is, I think, imagery that is as unique and a theology that is pretty unique but pretty cool. <laughs> so she writes, also, as truly as God is our father, as truly God is our mother. So in as much as God is our father, God is also our mother. And that uh, showed he in all, namely, and namely in these sweet words where he says, I it am. <laughs> that is to say, I it am, the might and goodness of the fatherhood. I it am, the wisdom and the nature of the motherhood. I it am, the light and the grace that is all blessed love. So God is everything in fatherhood. God is everything in motherhood. God is all that is blessed love. I it am, the trinity. I it am, the unity. So trinity, yes, of course, but also often um, for mystics, they're very interested in everything being together, unity, right? I am the high sother, sovereign goodness of all manner of things. I am who makes you to love. I am who makes you to long. I it am the endless fulfilling of all true desires. So it's kind of a holistic image, again, of uh, God's oneness, but also with specific imagery of the divine feminine, which is sometimes lacking in Christianity. Although, again, God does not have a gender in Christianity, although a lot of people think uh, uh, God is masculine or God is male. Um, that's not, we see right here, she's very orthodox and a, a known as a theologian of the church, and yet is saying something that is unusual for a lot of Christians to hear. And she further defines this as you go on in chapter 59. Also, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, so the idea in the doctrine of the Trinity in Christianity is there's one God, but God uh, exists in three persons, creator, Christ, and spirit. So the second person is Christ. So Christ, uh, the second person, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, in whom is the Father and the Holy Ghost. In other words, those are the other two persons in God. Uh, he is truly, and thus is Jesus our true mother, in nature, our first making. And he is our first true mother in grace by taking of our created nature. All the fair working and all the sweet natural offices of dear worthy motherhood are proper to the second person of the Trinity. For in him we find this godly will, whole and saved without end, both in nature and in grace of his own proper goodness. 
So he's looking, or sorry, she. So uh, Julian here is, is looking at, um, as she's understanding Christ and Jesus, the second person of the Trinity theologically, and is saying, really what we're seeing in terms of the qualities, these are the qualities that we in medieval England uh, associate with motherhood, um, you know, which is to say uh, charity and love and grace and all of those things. Those are, in, those are uh, really focused, are focused in the second person of the Trinity. And therefore we can understand especially the second person of the Trinity as being our heavenly mother, right? I understood three kinds of beholding of motherhood in God. The first is ground of our nature making. The second is taking of our nature, and there begins the motherhood of grace. The third is motherhood of working, and therein is a fourth spreading by the same grace of length, of breadth, and of height, and of deepness without end, and all is one love. And so um, she, she's identifying here qualities that she identifies with essentially the eternal principles of what which she sees as motherhood, and therefore is seeing these as totally being uh, a component or their source being God. And specifically then she's defining that within the idea of the second person of the, of the Trinity. But she's also equating that with love. So God is love, which is a fairly, again, mainline um, Christian theology. So to round out here, how we be brought again and forth, spread by mercy and grace of our sweet, kind and ever loving mother Jesus, and of the properties of motherhood. But Jesus is our true mother, not feeding us with milk, but with his himself, opening his side onto us and challenging all our love. So it's an unusual formulation, but I wanted to um, bring that out because this is, I think, um, something that people don't often um, anyway see. Okay, so let's go to the other um, <laughs> mystic woman that we are looking at. So one of the many visitors uh, that Julian would have had to her cell to seek advice and spiritual guidance and this sort of thing um, is Marjorie Kemp. So although um, we now have published um, Julian's theology, her book wasn't very widely circulated in her own lifetime and that wasn't what she was known for. Um, and so, but she was nevertheless very well thought of as a pious woman and also fulfilling this kind of spiritual role in the kind of religious community of Norwich. And so there's actually a whole bunch of um, records that we have of people, for example, leaving a bequest to the recluse in, in, Nor in St. Julian Church, you know, or to the, uh, to the anchoress. And so, because, because she was well thought of. But we also have a, an account um, uh, it was a visit that took place either in 1413 or a little bit before that from this fellow visionary Englishwoman from the nearby town of Kings Lynn uh, when Julian was perhaps 70 and Marjorie Kempwin was about 40. So they're not you know, precise contemporaries, they're a different generation, but they actually live very close. So we have over here Norwich is where Julian is from and is sold up and Marjorie's from the nearby town Kings Lynn. Bishop's Lent at the time. So here's from Marjorie's book, her description, or a little bit of it, we can't read the whole thing, of her meeting uh, Julian. And then she, so she refers to herself in her book in the third person here, so Marjorie Kemp, and then she was told by our Lord to go to an anchoress in the same city called Dame Julian. And so she did, and she showed her, Dame Julian, the grace that God put in her soul of compunction, contrition, sweetness and devotion, compassion with holy meditation and high contemplation. And so talking again about this kind of shared um, practice as opposed to doctrines um, or even the theology like Julian has. So meditation, contemplation, contrition, these are ways of following this mystic path, this inward path. Uh, and many holy speeches and dalliance that our Lord spoke to her soul. So she's telling her the different, she's telling, Marjorie is telling to Julian um, some of the revelations that she's had from the, our Lord and many wonderful revelations which she showed to the anchoress to know if there were any deceit in them. 
for the anchoress was expert in such things and could give good counsel. So I've had all of these visions from Jesus and other sources. Well, you, as this very recognized authority on Revelation, this very holy woman that's you know, holed up here in the cell in, in Norwich, will you say, oh yes, those are legitimate revelations, is in part what Marjorie is asking by going on this visit. That's one of the things that Julian could do for people. So the anchor is hearing of the marvelous goodness of our Lord, highly thanked God with all her heart for this visit, counseling this creature, counseling Marjorie to be obedient to the will of our Lord God and to fulfill with all her might whatever he put in her soul. So yes, these are real revelations. You should definitely be following them. Uh, unless <laughs> you get one, <laughs> you know, where it was against the worship of God or the prophet of her, uh, of her even Christian. For if it were, if it were then, it were not moving, the moving of a good spirit, but rather of an evil spirit. <laughs> so there's the kind of Julian is those, yes, those are from our Lord, unless you get something bad, and this is Julian's out, <laughs> in which case then you've really been talking to an evil spirit, so I'm not gonna be on the hook for that one. Um, so there is a little bit of an out clause here, but you can see Marjorie is getting what she wants, which is to have this recognized um, important uh, uh, mystic um, saying, yes, your, your uh, revelations are also true. Much was the holy dalliance uh, that the anchoress and this creature Marjorie had in sharing the love of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ the many days that they were together. So she hung out in the church there a long time so that she could talk about all the different things. Okay, so um, as opposed to an anchoress, Marjorie has got a very different kind of character and a very different kind of life. So she is, in fact, actually what I might say is a practical um, middle-class mystic laywoman. So although they're contemporary visionaries and they're actually from the same basic area of England, they had two different, very different lives. So Julian, as we saw, lived her life in a church as an anchoress. Whereas Marjorie's piety was as a middle-class um, laywoman. And so the division uh, in medieval Christendom is between people who are in clerical orders, so people who are uh, religious specialists of one type or another. Uh, it could be like, again, a, uh, you know, the hierarchy, which is to say the bishops who are very important or the abbots and things like that. Um, but then there's also the level of parish priests and lesser people in lesser orders, like the curates that we saw, friars, monks, um, and it's down to some pretty regular clerks who might only have just gone to university and are, are now getting some kind of a job that is involving literacy and things like that, but they don't actually in, um, and they aren't actually priests or in orders, and yet they're all sort of in part of the kind of the clerical universe. And then there's the whole vaster part of society, lay society, you know, starting at the top with the king and all the nobles, but all of them the rich burghers and, and so on down to the poorest peasants. Uh, who are not clerics, they're the lay people. And so Marjorie's a, Marjorie's a lay woman. She was born maybe around 1373. Um, she's the daughter of a rich merchant named John Brunham, who served as mayor of the town she's from, Bishop Lynn, and he was also um, occasionally a member of parliament when the king would call parliaments in order to try to raise money for his different wars. So she married a town official named John Kemp, and the two of them had at least 14 children together. <laughs> So uh, she had a very uh, busy and, and uh, lots of hardworking life uh, uh, all the way up to that point. Um, like Julian, Marjorie had a series of visions, although they weren't all at once through one illness, but rather she had kind of ongoing visionary experiences and they weren't all from one source. So sometimes she did have visions where demons are tempting her to do different things, sometimes from Christ, sometimes other saints. Um, and so it's more eclectic. Um, whereas Julian's visions led to that opt those optimistic and actually quite um, lofty, I would say, theological reflections. Marjorie's were altogether more practical and they were usually related to her own actual individual pious um, practices. So in one vision, just to give an example, Christ appears to Marjorie or speaks to her and uh, calls uh, her to, you know, gives her these things. This is what she should be doing. So she should call him her love. She should stop wearing that hair shirt that she's been wearing as an ascetic practice. So people would 
um, want to, for pious reasons, they want to mortify the body, so they wear a very uncomfortable shirt that's constantly itching and constantly reminding them uh, that they're doing that because of uh, they should be suffering for God in imitation of Christ's suffering. So he's, Christ says, nope, stop that. <laughs> you don't want to wear that itchy shirt anymore. But she should give up eating meat. She should take the Eucharist every Sunday. She should pray on the rosary like she does all the time, but only till six. So that should stop. <laughs> um, and she should then also be still and stop praying to him out loud all the time. She could do it in her head silently. <laughs> So in other words, there's a lot of practical instructions that she's getting as opposed to, you know, kind of these ideas that um, the second person of the Trinity is Holy Mother and that God is all about love and that creation is, you know, is all as well and is going to go forward because God has ongoing love for it, right? So it's a different levels of what they're contemplating, although they're both very pious women. So she's a laywoman. Um, she values books um, and she talks in her her own book about having them read to her. So she may not have been able to read it all herself because of the way she describes this, because she talks about employing scribes and also talks about having books read to her. But one of the books that she loved, and we mentioned that Bridget of Sweden, this contemporary, actually a little bit earlier mystic woman in Sweden who'd had revelations, including that revelation that changed how we see the picture of the nativity scene. And those may have inspired Marjorie's um, revelations. Um, when she started having these visions, she, because she valued books, she got it in her head that it, she would like to have them written down and they, these were important enough to tell her story. And this is kind of a neat new idea because um, it hasn't really happened in English before. And so um, as a result of her telling kind of her own story and, and justifying herself and explaining her visions and all of her different things that she does in her spiritual practice, she includes a lot of personal details that are essentially autobiographical. And so her book is sometimes called the first autobiography that's written in English. And certainly it's an amazingly rare and interesting window given that her gender and, uh, and her class as opposed to um, you know, the Confessions of St. Augustine where you have a very lofty and incredibly important uh, philosoph philosopher bishop who was able to write his own autobiography centuries before, before this. Um, this is a person who, generally speaking, we don't get a window into people at Marjorie's um, social class level. Uh, whereas though, we can also say, <laughs> Uh, whereas Julian's contemporaries very clearly appreciated her spiritual role, and we definitely see that with the, all of the people's bequests to her and the way she's uh, honored and respected, and indeed in Marjorie's own account, how much Marjorie is kind of looking to her for this kind of legitimacy about her own visions. Um, we can just say, based on Marjorie's own accounts of all of her interactions in her own book, she's way less appreciated by her contemporaries, uh, by her neighbors and everybody she interacts with. So, okay, so what is her ac general life um, uh, work? What she ends up being able to do after she's lived her kind of long life with her husband of these 14 uh, children, she's able to kind of like, she's negotiating before the end of the, before the 14th is born, but anyway, she's able to negotiate with her husband that eventually we're gonna get to a chaste marriage uh, where this child having is gonna stop. You're gonna have to just except that we got 14 and then after that, no more. <laughs> and so uh, she gets that to work out and then after that she's able to devote herself to lay piety, including then um, a life of just embarking on an amazing number of pilgrimages um, for somebody in her time period. So uh, her mystical practices uh, included the practice of dramatic weeping. And so she had the power to just simply weep allowed and a lot <laughs> um, and and what she would do is she would do that is beg Christ for mercy and forgiveness and that would be one essentially her ecstatic, ecstatic mystic practice uh, but because this is kind of loud and incessant <laughs> it was not always appreciated by everybody around her especially if she's on a long pilgrimage uh, with some people for example for days and weeks <laughs> and it doesn't ever stop so so she does record that um, that, for example, different friars would say, why, why won't you stop weeping? Just stop it. It's, you know, the top, top, top. And then she'll argue with them, though, that haven't you read that this particular mystic, that, you know, this particular mystic, that these tears are the signs of, of, of grace and the person has to admit it. And so then she's able to show them up in her own text, right? 
but you can see that that's, she is admitting to opposition though too, right? And so admitting to that she's irritating people. So as I mentioned then after um, she has this chaste marriage and her father uh, also dies, she goes on a very long pilgrimage, uh, crosses Europe, gets to Venice, hangs out in Venice, which is at its absolute height of splendor um, and spends weeks there. From there she sails to Palestine, which has ceased to be in Christian control, but Christian pilgrims still are able to go and visit the holy sites that are now um, in uh, Muslim custody. And so she visits Jerusalem and Bethlehem and other holy places. Her next, after she goes on, that's a, just an amazing long pilgrimage, if you can imagine, for the time. She next goes on a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, uh, which is just another one of the major pilgrim centers. When she is done with that one, <laughs> She decides she's heard of a major pilgrimage site that's off where the Teutonic Knights are. Um, so her, her son has been a, an official out there. And so she goes out to Danzig and then she comes back via Aachen, which is to say Charlemagne's capital, and so she's able to see that. Uh, and then she goes back via Canterbury, you know, which is the very famous site of uh, St. Thomas of Becket, St. Thomas of Canterbury. And so anyway, in the whole course of this, and because she is a professional pilgrim, um, there is often, she's very frequently um, drawn comparisons to a fictional professional pilgrim uh, contemporary in England, in Chaucer, um, the, probably the most popular character out of the Canterbury Tales, the wife of Bath. Um, and indeed, she probably is of the same kind of social class and, and Chaucer's um, pilgrims may have found the wife of Bath to be just as irritating to be on the, on the pilgrimage with Although the difference, one of the differences in terms of their characters is that the wife of Bath wasn't too, she was pretty happy that um, all of her many husbands that she had were all dead and, and she wasn't too worried about chastity. <laughs> Whereas, so that's a very different um, um, situation than Marjorie, who was very, very concerned about chastity. So, lay piety. So there's always a tension um, between lay piety and the clerics. And so in this era, when the English clerics uh, and even actually the officials after the Peasants' Revolt are on the lookout for these lollards, so we talked about um, this, what has become anyway a heresy, it's actually quite a radical idea, lollardy um, in England, but it continues to be kind of bubbling around. Uh, Marjorie was frequently the subject of suspicion, and so in her own book, while she's on a pilgrimage, she is... Uh, in Leicester, and she's arrested by the mayor there, who um, accuses her, again using the kind of court language here, Latin, uh, that she is a cheap whore, a lying lollard. I'm sure it sounds better in Latin. <laughs> you know? um, she is able to um, insist, you know, that as an English woman, that she has the right to have charges read against her in English. And so when, the, when she's arraigned or whatever and has the charges read to her, uh, and she's able to defend herself and, and essentially is initially able to get herself off, although she has to admit later they, um, the guy brings reinforcements and Abbott and a couple other people and they do bring her back to court and she's in prison for about three weeks. There's several other times where she gets into trouble because um, clerics say that she's preaching when um, women aren't allowed to preach and, uh, and also lay people aren't really supposed to either. Uh, and so as a result of that, though, she's able to say that uh, usually she's able to skirt that um, by saying, well, I'm not, I'm not preaching, I'm just telling about my personal life experience like she's doing with her story, with, it, with her book. So because she's telling about that, um, she, then she's usually able to, she outsmarts people in her own book, you know, so, so you can tell she's writing it herself. But anyway, so she's able to get off um, from those kind of encounters. Uh, but what we can kind of see here is, um, two different ways um, that women who are experiencing this kind of mystical piety, this desire to be connected to God, um, have, in one sense with Julian, um, she's able to be much more accepted by the system um, than Marjorie is able to na navigate, although she's, you know, she's just reasonably well for herself, all things considered, uh, at the end of the day. So essentially there is two different ways <laughs> Um, piety was able to be expressed by visionary women uh, at this time in medieval England. And so that's my take on women mystics in medieval England. Yeah, back to you first.
So I think uh, it's not just me who has this question. But what's with the the head that the <coughs> what, um, Kemp is holding? Yeah. Oh. Or what is that? <laughs> so these are so unfortunately we don't have any um, you know contemporary pictures of people uh, because they were. Uh, you know, Julian has become really popular in the 20th century, uh, and so there's all kinds of wonderful images that people have made that are modern, including in, in Norwich, there's a, a, a statue on her on the side of the church, uh, the cathedral, I think. And, um, but Mar in Marjorie, they've inspired, um, again, modern paintings. And so like I'll, when I'm going and using the old, the old 14th century stuff, it's often actually we're using the illustration of the wife of Bath <laughs> uh, in order to show Marjorie, as opposed to the illustration of Marjorie. Um, so she's got a vision um, there, and so she's seeing, um, it's a, a cloth, and uh, it's a, a vision of uh, Christ. It's like the shroud, I mean, I think the modern artist here is like showing something like the shroud of Turin kind of thing, you know, right? So it's a, um, talking about, again, about the, in this, in this image, actually, too, Christ is up here. So it's, again, referring to their kind of um, ongoing revelatory experiences that they're having as mystics. I, I'd just like to share an idea, uh, which I associate with the, with the mystical, if I, if I may. Yes. Um, you know, my name is David. I'm sort of the unknown philosopher of Toronto. I give talks at uh, the Free School in Parkdale. <coughs> anyway, so here's the idea. Um, I think that intrinsic to mysticism, uh, to be mystical, is the notion of union, as you mentioned earlier, John. Yep. And um, th that is to say, to somehow grasp and be part of a union of all things. So here's a sort of mystical idea that um, can be uh, briefly illustrated by contemporary uh, science, postmodern physics or uh, quantum physics. Um, for example, if you look at a glass, which I'm holding in my hand, you think it's pretty solid and right. sort of at this scale of reality. But if you look at, um, uh, at it subatomically, you'll see there's a lot of space in the atom. So it's the same glass. Um, yeah. The only difference between what looks to be substantive and doesn't have space and what is full of space is the scale. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so it's the same um, thing differentiated by scale. And I also may add that um, a scale is a musical structure. So you may think of sort of the musicality of reality and how um, the union of all things may have a sort of very musical character to them, and so I think the mystical vision is a, is a sort of um, music that you hear, yeah, which unites like you with different things and, and makes you aware that reality is one, but it's experienced in different scale at different scales. And we even have the um, the the music of the the uh, cosmic background uh, microwave, <laughs> right? The music <laughs> of the spheres and, and all those kind of things, so, which is to say, not only the the music of the spheres in the yeah. in the Platonic sense of the or the uh, Ptolemaic sense of the right. universe, but that in now in the like you say, in the uh, modern cosmologists who, you know, are, f are finding that in the background radiation or whatever. So yeah, that's a beautiful um, postmodern uh, cosmological vision of mysticism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, very good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I went on several pilgrimages, and several issues cropped up, and I didn't pursue the answers, but I wondered as a medievalist if you could shed some light on some of these issues. Okay. Uh, the first one, um, because we visited a lot of uh, saints and their bodies, with the first issue that I was wondering about was their incorruptibility, and what is the take on that. The second issue is stigmata, because St. Francis and uh, Padre P I think St. Francis had stigmata, yep. Padre Pio, uh, so what is that all about? <laughs> the third is the relics, um, because par relics are all over the place. So I, I saw St. Catherine's head in Siena and her body in Rome, and who gets to keep what parts of the body? <laughs> you know, I'm, like, I'm curious how this was negotiated and yeah. among all the various uh, parties. Yeah. And w you know why, what is the power of those relics? Because in medieval times, I'm sure that they had a lot of power. Yes. And then the fourth is holy sites. Where does the consensus come to determine that these are actual sites? Be and because 
um, what is the proof and legitimacy of that? Because these were sites that existed prior yeah. to maybe our very strict documentation. So, um, well, starting with the fourth first, <laughs> um, a lot of what imbues a holy site, you know, with its power is like tradition. And so in some of the cases, like in Jerusalem, um, some of the sites we know all like, do, do go quite all the way back. So the, the place where um, the Harum al-Sharif, the, the Temple Mount, um, you know, this is the site of where Herod's Temple would be. This is the site of you know, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the, and the Dome of the Rock. This is where the Templars were hanging out in the Christian Middle Ages. So that's, that, that, that one's pretty well known. The, um, the other Jerusalem sites, things like the, the Shrine of the, the Holy Sepulchre, which is the central Christian shrine, that's a traditional site that's existed since the fourth century. So, so, so um, Constantine's mother, St. Helena, who was a very early rich, fabulously rich patroness, patroness of Christianity, um, went around on a pilgrimage herself all across Palestine and, um, and identified different places. You know, local people would say, she'd ask, where was Christ crucified? And they, they all, the person who owned the spot had the, knew exactly where it was and she was ready to buy it, paying top dollar. <laughs> You know, so, so whether or not they had a tradition, an oral tradition of where any of those places are, were, they certainly were ready to supply those for her. Uh, and so that's one of the ways that the traditional sightings happen. And so in some cases, a traditional sighting doesn't have any better sourcing than going back to, let's say, St. Helena. And that's then the problem with it is to get past tradition. I mean, that's, that's been a good 1,700 years or something like that. So in other words, that site has been imbued with holiness traditionally now for that long. But to get it historically to the actual event, if you know, if the event is historical, um, there's no good provenance, so there's no sourcing. So it's, it's a traditional site, we say. And so then how does the other places become a site? So at different times um, and at different, uh, different sites are promoted. So Santiago de Compostela, um, uh, it's off on the fringes of, of, of Christendom at a certain point. Uh, uh, the monks there are ambitious, <laughs> they um, find uh, you know, they have, they have relics of what is probably an early Spanish saint and at a certain point they get confused or they are willfully confused and they decide that this is actually where St. James, uh, the greater, the apostle, so the sec one of the two, St. Jacob, St. Iago, is actually has his remains. Um, it becomes accepted because it's an old tradition. Uh, there's a certainly not historically true. <laughs> Um, but in any event, that's been a shrine there that is, continues to be a, a pilgrimage site. It's such a pilgrimage site that is so imbued with history because there's shrines all along the entire route um, that people go in huge numbers uh, to this day along that, along that route. People go to Jerusalem too. Anyway, so, that, so over time, sites develop um, holiness based on either they are historical, like Aachen is where Charlemagne <laughs> You know, is and it is where uh, you know the church that he built and everything like that, or they're traditional. So that was the fourth part, which was that the um, the point about relics. So in the in medieval times and antiquity, um, there is definitely a sense that uh, uh, that people aren't the people continue on after death, and that can Im include their their souls uh, are uh, continuing to exist, and we don't know what's going to happen to. Uh, you and me, uh, you know, because we're just not holy enough to be sure. But for some of these saints uh, whose lives we read about in medieval texts, hagiographies, lives of saints, we're very confident that they are uh, in God's court and are, are in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find their body or their, um, their own personal prayer book or their staff or, you know, whatever, whatever part of them, then you maybe ha are imbuing yourself with some kind of mojo that is connected to them. So you're, when you're talking to St. Catherine of Siena, because her head is right there in front of you, um, her physical remains, maybe she's listening to you more in heaven and can talk to God on your behalf than if you, you or I were just doing it and we don't have her head present, right? And so certainly that was um, a, a place for the mojo. As to who gets those things, um, People in the Middle Ages were amazingly opportunistic in terms of even stealing art relics, even if you can imagine, because you think um, it's pious, you're doing this for a religious reason, and yet you're gonna go and do like an international kidnapping where you steal the relics and take them back? Yes, we are, <laughs> you know, so, so definitely. I mean, that's why, um, that's why 
you know, the, the entire, in Venice is the cathedral there is, you know, the St. Mark's, and they have St. Mark's as the flag, and the whole thing is called the Republic of St. Mark, because some Venetians ran to Alexandria, stole St. Mark's body, they think, or at least they claim to, and brought it back, and they had it. So, so they would steal it. Um, at some points or other, I mean, with St. Catherine of Siena, I don't know exactly how her body is divided, but in any event, sometimes, sometimes they will be willing, willfully divided, and different relics will be left in different places, you know, on purpose. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes the way it would work, on a, so to your point on pilgrimages, so one of the things that people would do, that you, you have some reason why you have it, one of these life-changing moments, you want to, um, you want to some, there's a, either you feel at lost, you feel ill, there's something wrong, you need to have a new direction, you go on this vast pilgrimage, you are able to completely change your um, life's perspective, if you can imagine if you lived your entire life within a few miles of Norwich and suddenly you go to Jerusalem in the 14th century <laughs> and spent a whole three months in Venice and all this kind of thing, your, your world has changed now that you've seen that. Um, but it's also a spiritual and mystical journey. You probably, in Marjorie's case, she's weeping the whole way there and back. So there's, you know, that's going to cause you know, a, a lot of occasion for you know, um, being out of, out of your regular thought and into this kind of meditative, uh, even maybe even trance state or anything like that she, she could have been doing that would give her different experiences and insights. And when you go to that place, you don't usually, so when, when Folk of Anjou uh, went to uh, Jerusalem, he knocked off a piece of, the, of Jesus' tomb and brought it back with him. But he's, you're not, you're, people do that, you're not supposed to. <laughs> what you, what you, um, what you could do, though, is that they've, they've left like strips of cloth or something like that that the pre local priests there have blessed. You maybe give a donation to the, the pilgrimage site. You take the cloth back, and so then you have a relic of St. Catherine without having stolen her head. And so that's how that can work in a, in a pilgrimage site. And you had one more question, but I don't remember which one it was. It was unrelated. Oh, the stigmata. So... Um, so yeah, that's one of the, so it's another one of the mystical visions, and so St. Francis has that vision, and so um, one, of the, one of the ways that, um, so, so uh, Julian here is thinking about um, God as God the mother and motherhood and love. Um, another, another really popular thing, and then actually her visions start with this because of the bleeding Jesus, another popular vision is the suffering God, um, so the whole idea um, in Christianity is uh, the, the suffering servant in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible and Isaiah, is lived out in Jesus as Messiah. And so um, understanding God as suffering for us, as being the source as, you know, of, of having all of, your, all of your pain and all of the pain and, and, and misery and evil in the world, that, uh, that Jesus bore that, you know. Um, then, then Francis is donating, you know, um, dedicating his life to that mystical union then with God, that God is Christ, and that Christ has suffered is the sign of those, those wounds. And so those then are mirrored spiritually in Francis or anybody who receives the sign of stigmata. And so once, once it happens as one thing, anybody can then also presumably have that kind of a vision. And so that's what I would say that that refers to. Incorruptibility. Of the oh, incorruptibility. So, so in antiquity, so we're just talking about like, so for example, Cancer of Siena. One of the things that um, just people as a general idea have had is that, um, I don't know, that good people, their remains aren't going to decay. <laughs> and so that's usually been a sign. It's not only Christians that do that. But anyway, so it's just been a sign that, um, of eternalness, you know, so because God is eternal, the more saintly you are, the more likely that your, even your, your holy remains are that they're going to not decay because um, decay and change is mortality and the mortal coil. And the closer you are to the eternal, the less likely um, that there's, the, at least it's going to be slowed down, right? And so when people see um, remains and they dig it back up in two centuries later and they say, oh my goodness, the person is as fresh as yesterday when we put them in, um, you know, that's in part a... Um, it's a part in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> and so the local monks and bishops may, you know, they may want to have a, an agenda where they see it as uncorrupted for one thing, <laughs> because then that is proving the sanctity of the, of the individual and also the relics, therefore, that they own. And so they would frequently dig people up and, and it, it behooves you to, to have seen that the people are essentially uncorrupted, maybe depending, it's again, the eye of the beholder, what that means. I have a question from Roylene uh, Ottensen. Okay. 
Uh, you stated Marjorie was less accepted than Julian of, of Norwich. Is that because she was a visual woman out and about the people? Was there more respect for a voice of a woman locked away? <laughs> like Clara of Assisi was similar as she was cloistered. Yeah. I'm just wondering about the culture of women being in public with their voice at this time. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that that's exactly right. So um, it's a good insight. Uh, and so this is, so they're both, um, so Julian is, it, it, literally, she has this incredible role that's respected, but it, it, it was, comes at the cost of actually being bricked up you know, behind a wall, right? And so therefore, um, in that sense, you have, you've literally contained her within the cell so that, so that all the spiritual power is at least contained and curtailed and it's not going to get away and do crazy things, <laughs> you know, because you know that where, she's, where she is. Whereas Marjorie is, she's really running around the entire planet, I mean, you know, on, on her own and, and really without any, anybody to tell her what to do. Uh, her, at some point or other, again, she's able to, I mean, I, how she negotiates with her husband, the chastity of chase marriage, and he's probably at a certain point ready to not have her around <laughs> anyway. And so anyway, so she is really running around on these on her own and doing these kind of things. And so it is possible to do, and she is able to have this happen, but she she does encounter a lot of opposition to it. And so probably it's a kind of, a, it's, I'd say it's a couple things. One of the things that is, that is true is also, um, there's a thing with, uh, with, being kind of a middle class where you aren't well educated, but you have a little bit of wealth and are able to do stuff, um, you aren't able to um, navigate these things in as quite as sophisticated a way. And so she was potentially rubbing, you know, elbows up against people. But more, more to the point, as I think your point, uh, a woman who is she, she is allowed to be on pilgrimages. Women are allowed to go on pilgrimages, but. If she strays outside of those kind of bounds, she gets in trouble, and so then she has to yell down the uh, the people, the men that are uh, essentially telling her, "You have to stop preaching. You're a lollard. You're." I mean, as even it says, they're calling her a whore, right? In the in the, in the charges. So that, that's the way women are constantly disparaged. So even though she's a woman who's absolutely devoted, um, you know, to chastity, that this is a um, this is something that is that the men in power are using to keep women from being able to express themselves this way. Yeah, back there. Oh, or up here first. Je Elizabeth first, I'm sorry. <coughs> Loud are the bells of Norwich and the people come and go here by the tower of julian i tell them what i know ring out bells of norwich and let the winter come and go all shall be well again i know oh. sydney carter wow and her Theology worked into it. It's wonderful and message. That's fantastic. So Jane and the and yeah. It's, it's to the point. Yeah, perfect. Do, do we know what the philosophy uh, uh, Marjorie was preaching? Uh, was she carrying uh, the message of the earlier? No. Scene? So they are not. They're not the same on the same page. And so um, Marjorie is not even aware of of Julian's philosophy. And so Marjorie is aware of her as a spiritual woman who uh, it give, has revelations. And as Marjorie even says, she knows that, that Julian knows whether uh, revelations are going to be are real or not. Uh, and so she sees her as a source of legitimacy. But, but, but Julian's book is not widely circulated. And so it becomes known um, after it's published in 1670 and especially very popular in the 20th century. And obviously there's songs written about it and things like that. But she is not, therefore, um, a devotee of, of Julian's philosophy. And hers, like I say, she is not a theologian. She, um, she is uh, somebody who is interested in her own kind of individual pious practice. And so her book doesn't really talk about, doesn't give like this kind of deep theological ideas, but are instead talking about how she's expressing her piety uh, you know, by pilgrimage, by uh, having spiritual visions you know, with Christ and others, and then also um, the different kinds of, of holy practices that she engages in, as opposed to ideas. So she is not doing much preaching on her travels. 
she's not supposed to preach, <laughs> but, but she is kind of probably talking more than she is allowed to. In fact, We'll have to, let's make these last, la can you be the last one and then we can take it offline because okay. actually we've, everybody's had to sit too long. <laughs> Go ahead. So I hope this isn't too off topic, but it's something I've been interested with uh, learning what Christian mysticism is. A lot of, I know a lot of people are having these, these visions. Uh, I'm wondering how much uh, Christian mystics would talk about dreams that they had or what the relevance of the things that people see in their dreams might have been to this sort of topic. Yeah, so, so yeah, the, there is a, um, a big overlap between dreams and visions. And so in a lot of cases, uh, people understood um, dr you know, dreams that you might have had to be a vision, but then you have so many more dreams that maybe don't count. So it is a matter of deciding you know, is this an ephemeral thing that is just, that isn't uh, something that's a message that's relevant, or are you actually receiving um, some kind of revelation? And so, uh, and so yes, I, I, it's, it's, there is a, I would say there's a big overlap, and, and that may be one of the sources for um, revelation is dreams. Uh, but it doesn't mean that everybody's dream counts as a revelation, and so it is something you have to kind of work through and decide, you know, whether it is. Were there any mystics that are well known whose main source of revelations was dreams? Did you know of? Um, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. That'd be something to maybe be interested in looking up. I don't know. I don't. I have to say, I don't remember any. Um, so I was listening to this philosopher, um, and he was asked this question about um, how a female or feminine mass, uh, feminine mysticism would present because um, his, he, he stated that um, the typical mysticism that we generally know about, um, especially in the East, has a stereotypical um, uh, masculine approach to it, like you know, men staring at walls yeah. in, uh, in, in caves. And so yeah. he expressed female mysticism to be a, um, possibly more embodied Expressive, and so one of the examples that he gave was um, similar, to, similar to like this, but it was like kissing the wounds of lepers and stuff. And so yeah. I was wondering if you had other examples of um, uh, more feminine uh, mysticism, how that would look like um, beyond Christian, like within Christianity. Yeah, so, within and beyond. Um, so I don't know that it has to be differentiated in that way by gender. I think that in the in the, the vast portion of the Christian tradition, um, most all of this, uh, these mystical experiences can be had both by men and women. There's almost always in the case of, let's say, when there's anchoresses and there's anchorites. So there are men that are also in these cells that are you know, living liminally between this world and the next in that same kind of um, embodiment of that. The same thing is true going back through um, the central Middle Ages of, the, of the, the monastic tradition. So there's nuns as well as, as monks, and they're devoting themselves to meditation, to, to chanting, to singing, which are all these kind of mystical practices. And so um, I don't know that it has to be female or male, but maybe like you say, there is some of these things where, um, you know, there, there was kind of an, a, a, a Flare up of famous female mystics, anyway, in this kind of century. Um, I guess I'm not differentiating uh, just in terms of gender, but more masculine feminine. Like that oh. So, I guess it depends on on how you interpret what um, what the roles are. So the uh, the early maybe an early example of where it's more the masculine kind of energy in early, let's say, Christianity is the kind of desert hermit fathers who are kind of are kind of shock troopers for against paganism and so they'll go into the kind of Anatolia into Syria and they they burn down the temples they chop down and they go to, to Gaul they chop down the Druids tree um, they they're doing all of these kind of um, pious activities like you know going up on the top of a pillar and and not you know living up there and, and doing this kind of spiritual feat of not having anything to eat and living up there for 20 years or something like that. And so maybe all that kind of um, 
um, very active, going around and smashing stuff, and then also doing super heroic feats or something are, are sort of seen as the kind of the masculine kind of um, asceticism. And then, um, uh, but then the church doesn't like that after very long, you know, because it's actually a little bit of, of disruptive. And so what they really want to do is coordinate into a kind of a, um, where you take the monks instead of having them off doing that kind of thing, you say, hey, why don't we all put you inside this monastery? Um, and when that is happening, then it's, it's very much able to, you know, because again, you've cloistered the monks. It's like you put them in the cells also as, uh, with the anchorites, um, that it's, as, it's more fitting or more acceptable for women to have that same kind of, that same kind of piety. Um, the female kind of piety, the expression that is very prevalent all through the Christian tradition is, um, is intercession. And so uh, the role that happens in the royal court, um, what the king is supposed to do is be, uh, just to be angry all the time, and he's supposed to give very harsh judgments so that it shows how strong he is. Uh, but often it will be stage managed where the queen then, after the king says, off with his head, <laughs> Then the queen will come and she intercedes and she weeps. Oh, you know, you can't do this because, you know, you, what, you, know, you need to be shown to be also a generous and merciful king. And that's like the kind of the role in the, that's understood in the court, that kind of merciful role of intercession. Um, and that they did that for real in the, in the courts. But then it's also understood through the religious practice. And so the whole reason of like praying to all of these women saints, especially Mary, is that you are asking for that kind of intercession from God, right? You know, where they are uh, performing that sort of uh, intercessory role. All right, so let's end it here and thank you guys so very much. And then we can, we'll say bye to everybody who's joining us online, but we can continue to discuss over snacks here in the facility. Thanks. Yeah, please do stay. There's lots of food, lots of beverages too.